Hi guys, this is Vaish from Vaish IAS and uh, we are going to continue our spectrum series. We have done till chapter 6. So now we will do chapter 7 and uh, what we are going to do is we are going to include chapter 12 as well because chapter 12 is very uh, very small chapter dealing with uh, the economic impact of British rule in India. And uh, I'll tell you the reason uh, during the lecture like why we are merging it together. And so uh, two chapters will be done today in one single video. Both are very small chapters, but both are very important chapters with respect to mains, not prelims. Yesterday when we did uh, uh, social uh, movements in India, it was more uh, with respect, more important with respect to prelims. But this is more important with respect to mains. Uh, we'll see. We'll begin now. So first thing is. This chapter, chapter 7, is it's about the uh, actual beginning of the struggle of Indian national movement. Like we have seen the revolt of 1857, then we saw slowly, slowly social movements are beginning to creep in. And uh, uh, people have been slowly real realizing that the British is not in favor of Indian interest. So the Indians will start um, uh, their uh, agitation or showing of their frustration by different means. So what were actually the factors? This can be a main question. What can? What are the factors uh, which led to the growth of Indian nationalism in the 1850s or after the uh, uh, second half of 19th century? So we'll see the factors. First one is political, administrative, and economic unification. So the British, as you know, we have seen they were capturing places across India, whether it be in the south, west, north, or east. So in all directions, they were forming their um, uh, trading posts, they were forming their um, territories by imposing different annexation policies. So all these things started forming a unified boundary for India. Like it's mentioned here, the Himalayas, Cape Comorin, Khyber Pass, Assam, this is in the four directions, four uh, sides of India. And they started to establish uniform judiciary, professional civil services, and they started to codify all the laws, the criminal laws and civil laws. And uh, also the rail and transport was set up during the time of Lord Dalhousie in the 1850s. So all these things started to bring about unification, whether it, uh, whether it is in terms of uh, political administration or whether it is in the terms of economy. Even the trade, the crops, everything was interrelated. It started to affect region by region. So this unification, it's actually uh, everything was done by the British. So British, although they were doing everything for their gain, it indirectly started inspiring the Indians to come together and the idea of India was being developed. So this is the first and most important factor for the growth of Indian nationalism. Second one is the understanding of contradiction in Indian and colonial interest and this is the time when the middle class will be rising so earlier the indians they had no clue of what is happening they were uh, ruled by different rulers over different times like uh, the delhi sultanates is there mughals are there then after that uh, the british is coming so they were not actually bothered or they did not have any idea what is going on they were paying their taxes they were living their life so when the Britishers came and they, uh, these people, Indian people tried to uh, uh, understand the idea of India more, they understood like the colonial interests are more to uh, take out all our wealth and then uh, destroy Indian economy. So this realization or this understanding between the different tastes of what Indians want and what the Britishers actually wanted, this realization is one major factor which can be uh, used in your answer. Third one is Indian Renaissance. We have seen a full chapter for this. The social uh, religious reforms and the modernization, the inclusion of sciences, uh, the modern or progressive thinking by different uh, leaders, uh, right from Raja Ram Mohan Roy to Swami Vivekananda, we have seen in detail about the Indian Renaissance. If you have not seen the last uh, chapter, please watch that video, chapter 6, and then proceed uh, to this video. So this is also an important reason. Western education, thought, English language, philosophy, science, liberty. We have seen all this in detail. Next is the role of press and literature. Like you know, Indian press had started developing. 
in in all the three provinces like bengal there was the bengal gazette newspaper the bombay there was bombay uh, courier i think madras courier was there, there were different papers newspapers in both uh, foreign languages and vernacular languages and uh, if you see the statistics by 1877 about 169 vernacular newspapers that is indian language newspapers were already in circulation and so people started to not only learn the news happenings around they also started to get educated on basic values of democracy civil rights freedom uh, self government industrialization they started to learn all these things and they started to know how other countries are doing or how actually a democracy works so they started uh, coming out and questioning the british uh, uh, laws then rediscovery of india's past the leaders great leaders like vivekananda he addressed the people they he started to uh, Ex- explain the greatness and richness of the, the country of india so this kind of realization socially and spiritually also motivated the people to come forward a glorious trade relation so india used to have great trade relations with the roman roman empire and other countries uh, uh, during the uh, olden era before christ so the, all all these time uh, things uh, were think people did not know about all these things so when leaders came forward and started to tell people of how great a country india is and how people should try to regain their self respect all this led to nationalist feelings among the people world events obviously when they started to gain knowledge uh, through education and through newspapers they came to know about what is happening in france what is happening in usa how they were also a colon- colony under british and they were um, uh, coming out and liberating themselves to form a great democracy so indians also felt like they should also step forward and, and gain independence for themselves reactions to british policies like you know britishers had very tough or strict policies which were very harsh on to the indians Uh, so these are few policy names which we'll we we'll see in detail when we do different different chapters the vernacular press act we have mentioned multiple times in our videos uh, it was an act by lord lipton uh, which uh, banned or which pro- uh, which uh, imposed lot of restrictions on indian newspapers so uh, there are a lot of interesting stories about it we'll see when we do uh, newspapers later also i have mentioned about this in our first chapter chapter 1 which was sources and approaches so there also you can get the names of multiple newspapers and works by uh, leaders which are important for prelims please watch the chapter 1 uh, so next is age of civil services was being reduced from 21 to 19 so the britishers were uh, not even allowing indians to attend civil service exams during the earlier days and later when it was allowed also they started to reduce the age limit so indians who were already late in getting primary or secondary education they could not appear for the civil service examination which used to happen in london at that time not in india used to happen outside so also the age limit reduction all these things were um, creating anger among the indian youth and they started uh, revolting then the delhi darbar delhi darbar we have two to three darbars which we will learn maybe we will make a table and tell you when which years it happened and which was the king or queen which visited india during the delhi darbars so in 1877 a famine was happening a very bad condition for indian peasants and indian villages and that time they did a very lavish Uh, organization of delhi darbar so this also created anger among the indians when people are dying they are celebrating over there then the ilbert bill controversy second related to the judiciary indian uh, judges were not allowed to try any uh, foreign people so the indian judiciary was undermined and indian judges were not given any good status compared to the uh, uh, foreign counterpart so that was again a uh, controversial bill which was in the time of lord ripon and later it was repealed so like this the reactions to british policies also was a start of growth of indian nationalism so these are very important points which you have to make a note and you can write in detail easily you can form a 150 word answer with these points now as you all know indian national congress which is there even now the congress party this was the first it's not the first actually but it was the most important one uh, during the nationalist struggle which will uh, be forming the constituent assembly later and writing the constitution for india so but even before indian national congress across the three provinces bengal british uh, sorry bengal bombay and madras there were multiple small small associations happening by different nationalist leaders and later each of them um, will combine together or come together to form the major indian national congress so we'll see the names of few which can be important for prelims so we'll see the names of a few uh, organizations 
so this is actually just telling the differentiation between how the first half of 19th century and how the second half of 19th century went the first one was dominated by only the wealthy people uh, and the small regional character so the geographical span was less and they used to simply write long long petitions to the british but it was of new no use actually the british never ca cared of what petitions are being written the second half actually came up with the educated middle class because you know by 1830s and 1850s education had started in india and people were becoming more intellectual and they knew about the world happenings and they were actually going into the civil services or to the uh, lawyer uh, advocate they were becoming advocates and lawyers so people were actually intellectuals and they knew how to demand for their uh, needs or they uh, the uh, growth of indians they actually knew how to uh, demand uh, get their demands fulfilled so that is the difference of timeline now we we'll see the different associations this is the first one in bengal we we'll see five or six i think bengal has the most number of association because the most intellectual class or leaders of that time was there in uh, west bengal bengal actually uh, the split of bengal uh, bengal has not yet happened so bangi bhasha prakashika sabha 1836. This was by associates of Raja Ramon. It's not by Raja Ramon, it's by the associates of Raja Ramon. So you basically can trick you by putting this statement like it was started by Raja Ramon, right? So make a note of this. Next is Zamindar's Association, which is also called Landholder Society. So this was actually for the uh, grievances of landlords. The landlords had their problems, and so they formed their own society to uh, ask certain favors to the British government. So Zamindar's Association. third is bengal british society 1843 so this is i think in the order of timeline so 1843 actual conditions of the indians so indian problems were raised through this society bengal british society now two and three the zamindars association and the bengal british society they'll come together and they'll form a very important body called the british indian association so you see right B british bengal is changed to british indian by merging with the zamindars association it is in 9, 1851 and they used to send petitions for separate legislature reduce salary of higher officers abolish uh, du unwanted duties and also they had a huge influence in forming the uh, conditions of charter act 1853 we will see all the charter acts and council acts later in the administrative chapter so this is also important body british indian association then east india association is very important because it was started by dada bhai naroji dada bhai naroji is called the grand old man of india who is who was a very uh, great economic nationalist it was started in 1866 it was started uh, with a uh, few indians in england indian league it started by sir kumar ghosh in 1875 so this is a definite potential question for match the following uh, remember these names indian league by sir kumar ghosh uh, east india association by dada bhai naroji Indian Association of Calcutta by Surendranath Banerjee and Anand Mohan in 1876 this is the most important before the INC before Indian National Congress if any body could reach a lot of people or could create some impact for the indians it was Indian Association of Calcutta it was against the landlord policies and it was more uh, poor, uh, pro poor and it had a low fee for its membership so they used to take charge uh, fees for their membership all these bodies but this had a very low fee so it was pro poor so these are the important bodies in bengal so please try to remember at least the final three which we have mentioned here east india association by dada bhai naroji indian league by shishir kumar ghosh and indian association of calcutta by surendranath banerjee and anand mohan this can be a question in bombay two important bodies are there one is pune pune sarvajanik sabha and bombay presidency association it's very easy to remember because it's two uh, place names pune and bombay and these two one is by uh, mg ranade and and mg ranade we had seen in the last chapter also because he did a lot of work for the upliftment of women and betterment of women so that becomes important bombay presidency association is by three important leaders bazuddin tyabji firoz jah mehta and kt telang in 1885 this was once asked in upsc who were the leaders associated with bombay presidency i think one or two years back only it was a very recent question so this is important and bazuddin tyabji is again important because he was the first muslim to become the president of indian national congress we will see the formation of indian national congress after this next slide that time we will see the uh, uh, leaders also the presidents 
not everyone we see that in a different uh, chapter maybe but baduddin tyab ji is the first muslim to become the indian national congress president next is madras madras i think only one body madras is madras mahajan sabha so these are the names veera raghava chari and subramanya ayer and ananda charlu in 1884 So all these are like the timeline is close. We know Indian National Congress formed in 1885. So these are all important contemporary bodies happening in different different locations. So these are easy to remember because the name itself have the place name Pune and Bombay, and here we have Madras Mahajan Sabha. Only the leader names you have to remember. We have also Chari Subramani Mahajan. Subramani is again associated with the Hindu and. One more newspaper is there. If you know, you can tell it in comments. We have told it multiple times in previous videos, which were the journals of Subramani Ayer. Okay. Now we will see the actual uh, formation of Indian National Congress in 1885. The two pictures which you see right side, they are A O Q and W C Banerjee. A O Q was a retired civil servant. He is the one who actually uh, asked Dufferin. Dufferin, Lord Dufferin was the viceroy at that time who asked Lord Dufferin to form this body. and wc banerji was the first president so the first president was an indian and he is wc banerji so the prelude to that indian national conference a body was there we saw it in the previous slide uh, at calcutta so this was by surendra banerji and anand mohan this was a body which was equally important at that time so how the indian uh, national congress will uh, uh, perform or uh, how it will operate it will be like every december that is once in a year every december it will meet in a different place of uh, india different part of india and the condition was the president cannot be from that particular place this statement is very important because this is one major reason or one major clause which will be uh, causing the split between moderates and extremists we extremists we will see that in the next chapter i think but it is a very important point you should remember the president cannot be Uh, from the same place, like uh, if Bal Gangadhar Tilak is from Bombay Presidency, and if the INC uh, meeting is happening over there in that December, he cannot be the president that year. He has to wait till the next year. So this was one major reason. We'll see that in detail later. It's very important, and questions have been asked multiple times based on all these things. 1890. This is for prelims. Kadambani Ganguly. He, she was the. first woman to address inc so this can be a question who was the first woman to address inc and they will give choices like uh, um, sarojini naidu ani besant kadambini ganguly so you should know like she who was a graduate from calcutta was the first to address inc she was not a president she was the one to address inc now the safety wall controversy a uh, lot of historians have been debating over this and multiple books are written over this multiple articles are there in the uh, um, Uh, archives so this is actually uh, a version like aoq convinced different to form this but why it was actually because indians were forming multiple bodies we saw in the last slide across india pan india movement were happening and leaders were coming up with different bodies and they were becoming a challenge or a threat to the british government british india government so what these people the retired civil servant ao hume thought is why don't we make a body ourselves and give some representation to few of these leaders most important ones they'll be can uh, put it in the inc so that uh, they also the britishers themselves had a control over the indians and all the other bodies will automatically collapse so that there is a controversy of whether this is true or not but this is a version given by most historians and it's called safety wall controversy so see it was like for releasing the growing discontent among the indians they wanted to simply appease few of the indians and make indians work according to them that is why inc was formed this is a story of safety wall controversy but bipin chandra he has his own view and he is telling like the early congressmen used hume as a lightning conductor that is as a catalyst to bring together the nationalist forces even in the guise of a safety wall so bipin chandra is saying that the indian national uh, congress leaders of that time they knew like what the english or british are, are trying to do they are trying to make a body of their own but even after knowing that the congress leaders wanted to use this opportunity and used this uh, um, activity of hume as a catalyst to bring together all the nationalist forces from across india so 
both versions are there we don't know which is correct but this is a debate which is going on so you should know this uh, particular story so moderate now we don't have a concept of extremist that will come later moderates are the leaders uh, who were the initial uh, congress leaders dada bhai naroji sn banerji wc banerji firosha mehta we have seen these names in the previous slides also they believed in moderate and liberal pol politics that is they were very slow but they did it in a very orderly organized way they used to uh, do lot of meetings they used to write long long petitions but they did it everything in a very um, organized way they did not uh, demand with a very harsh tone or they did not uh, walk out of the uh, uh, congress or they did not do anything harsh they always did it in a very organized way petitions meeting prayers and they thought like the britishers were unaware of the real situation that is what they initially thought like britishers did not know like poor are being uh, discriminated or there is racial overtones or they did not know so we if we let them know what is happening the real picture of india maybe they will help this was the initial mindset of the moderates so the inc sessions which i told will be happening in different parts of india was once actually planned to help, uh, happen in london as well in 1892 but due to some reason it was postponed and never revived later so you should know this like the indian national congress meetings never happened outside india this is one important point british committee of inc was formed in london in 1890 this is a body formed that is, it's a, just a version of inc which was formed in london they thought time is not right for direct action so educate the masses and involve inc so they thought like the time is not right for direct action or doing any harsh uh, taking any harsh step so they were just busy with educating the people and uh, trying to involve the educated people in uh, in the indian national congress meetings so evaluation of early nationalist so this is again how they were the nature of them spectrum has a detailed analysis of it so we'll see Uh, they represented the most progressive forces of that time so that time everyone were like in chaos or they were in pockets of geographical area so indian national congress leaders were the most progressive ones among all of them they were able to create wild national awakening of indians having common interest so this is again they did not reach the masses actually but they could connect with the high level intellectuals with who had common interest from different parts so they brought together uh, these uh, leaders they trained people on political work and popularized modern ideas so they were uh, like we saw in the previous slide they were not ready for direct action so they were trying to improve politically and educationally they were trying to improve themselves they exposed exploitative character of the british that we'll see in the next slide when we see about the economic drain theory uh, they uh, made people realize like the british is actually uh, looting the entire wealth of india and taking it outside india they were not communal at all like they did not represent a particular religion they were only uh, working for the actual problems in india so they were not communal oh, uh, why did it uh, initially fail to create a great impact was they could not widen their democratic base or reach to the minority that is they did not reach till the uh, last man in india they did not uh, reach the poor or the peasants they were doing lot of uh, they were pull, pulling out leaders who were representing them but they could not actually connect to the actual masses moderates and early nationalists lacked faith in the masses they actually thought like the masses are uneducated and they are not fit for coming into the meetings of incs uh, felt they were ignorant and had to be first welded into a nation before their entry into political sphere so they thought they should be first educated and Uh, given information about how a polity works how a government works and only then they can be uh, involved in the meetings they fail to realize that only by political participation and national struggle movement they can come together so again the same thing they wanted to bring together peop uh, people by a national uh, national struggle but they failed to do it because they did not allow everyone to participate now these are two three important statements in spectrum government the british government called the inc nationalists as seditious brahmins or disloyal babus because earlier indians were working under the british and now when they were uh, raising their voice the british government uh, started to call them by these kind of names slowly slowly you will see the, the divide and rule policy also will come so they started to picture inc as a hindu body also everything was actually done by british the indian national congress leaders were actually not at all communal but the uh, british will create or paint a picture that 
Indian uh, INC was representing Hindus. So these are certain terms. Dufferin, the viceroy, called the INC as a factory of sedition. So sedition, you know, like going against the government, that is sedition. Uh, so Dufferin called INC as a factory of sedition. Government tried the policy of divide and rule, which I was speaking earlier, and carrot and stick policy. Carrot and stick policy again, uh, they will show some small benefit or some small thing to appease them and tell, like, uh, he, uh, see, we have done something for you. So that is all the carrot policy. They will show something and attract the Indians. And uh, if they were not listening to or not obeying what the British wanted uh, uh, to impose on them, then they will use the stick policy and they will uh, put a punitive charges so or they will do something to. Uh, yeah. suppress them. So that is the characteristic policy. We will see them in uh, future chapters. Encourage reactionary elements like Sir Sayyid Ahmed. If you remember in the last chapter, we, I have already told you this point. Sir Sayyid Ahmed who started the Aligarh movement. He was uh, actually promoting western sciences and education among the Muslims and he was actually a reformist. And uh, the British actually uh, took advantage of this. He started to uh, give a fund and all those things to these leaders, Muslim leaders and made them, uh, what to say, competitor to the INC. Even though every national state was coming together in INC without any communal feelings, British imposed this communal hatred and started to form uh, other bodies through the Muslim uh, leaders. So one body is UPA, which is not the present one, not the UPA which we see in news today. UPA was a uh, I think uh, Unified Indian Patriots Association or something. So that body was found by Sir Said Ahmed, which was a body which will be like a rival body to INC. Now we will see certain contributions of moderates. We have also seen in the last slide, like uh, when we evaluated the nationalist. So these are again points, important points which can be a main question. So please make a note of it. Constitutional reforms and propaganda in legislature. So they had started raising their voice in the legislature, in the INC meetings and so they started influencing the reforms what is happening in the British India government and Indians participation had also increased. Indian Council Act 1892, like I said we will discuss all the acts later but because the timeline is around 1890s now, we will see a few points. More members were allowed in the Imperial Legislative Council and Provincial Legislative Council. So Indians' participation are in, uh, were increasing by this act. All this was happening because of the uh, voice raised by moderates. Some additional non-official members in Governor's Council. Even in the Governor's Council, uh, Indians were getting admission. And a slight type of election had already started. Indirect election, not the direct ones, but indirect election had slowly started by this Council Act 1892. They had also been allowed to discuss the budget, but they were not allowed to vote. This, these are all terms under this particular Act, okay? Indian Council Act 1892. When we, after this, we'll have the Indian Council Act 1909, which is the model and mentor reforms, where a uh, lot of uh, gain is happening for India. There uh, again, uh, the voting will be allowed. Like that, many things will come, but these are only for 1892 Act. Budget could be discussed but not voted. Questions could be asked but no supplementary questions. So they were getting uh, uh, small small permissions for small small things but with certain restrictions. So by each act because of the efforts of moderates and Indians things started getting good for India. So that is what is the first point. Constitutional reforms and propaganda in legislature. Demand for self-government. Dada Bhai, Gokhale, Bal Gangadhar these were important leaders of that time, 1890s, who started demanding for self-government. And they gave the slogan, no taxation without representation, need majority of Indians in higher positions. So they told, you can tax us, but only when you give equal representation in the British government. And high salaries, pension, attack on other countries, rights of Indian abroad, so all those places where fund was misused and simply wasted uh, by the British uh, officers. This was being questioned and even the rights of Indians living abroad were uh, demanded. So you can see the leaders have been uh, asking the right questions to the right officers and this all were contribution of the moderates. They exposed corruption of bureaucracy, criticized uh, government policies and foreign policies the right to freedom of speech, associate movement press, these are all the fundamental rights in the present day India. So all these were being raised in the 1890s itself by all these leaders. 
economic critic of british imperialism this this is where uh, we'll see why chapter 12 is being merged in chapter 7 because chapter 12 the name is economic impact of british india so that was just a, a chapter to give the points of economic uh, um, uh, economic uh, problems in india so i thought i'll merge it along with this because this point is also a contribution of moderates so the leaders or the critics were dada bhai naraji r c dutt and d e vacha this was also asked in i think 2014 prelims they gave a list of four five names and asked whether who of the following were economic critics so you should know the name dada bhai naraji r c dutt and d e vacha are the three important names there are many others also but these are three important names drain of wealth theory transformation of basically self sufficient economy into colonial economy so india was a self sufficient economy and was the richest country of that time uh, but uh, britishers changed it into a colonial economy and indian economy was collapsed so we will see the economic impact this is actually from the chapter 12 and this is how so chapter 7 had only that much information it was about how the different kinds of bodies came uh, how the indian national congress was formed um, what is the safety uh, wall theory we have seen everything how uh, the nationalist movements began and what were the contributions of moderates now we will see the economic impact in detail which is the chapter 12 so in right side the pictures you see is rc dutt and dada bhai naraji economic dream this theory was the portion of national product of india that is the gdp of india which was not available for consumption of its people but was getting drained away to britain for political reasons and india was not getting adequate economic or material returns to it so a great portion of the indian gdp was not at all being useful for indian people and british would take it out to in, uh, their own land uh, in england and give weird reasons for that and indians did not get any material returns two important leaders and two important books by them dada bhai naraji poverty and unbritish rule in india rc dutt the economic history of india so you should know this m g ranade gopalakrishna gokhale g subramanian iyer prithish chandra ray these are also economic nationalists major components that is we already told like lot of things from the indian national gdp were going out but in what forms were it going this also was asked once in prelims like which of the following were part of economic dream so we see the salaries and pensions of civil and military officials everything was being paid from indian taxes indian money interest on for foreign loans taken by the government that means they will take loans from uh, other countries and the interest payment was done by indian money indian tax profits of foreign investment in india so people were coming to india and investing in india by crumbling the indian industries which we will see later uh, so whatever profits were getting gained everything was going out from india it was not being uh, useful for any indians store purchases even the stationery and store purchases in british uh, britain for civil and military department so even their office store purchases were done by using indian people's money so whatever when we when we see uh, uh, pictures or videos of present day england now we can see very beautiful buildings very beautiful bridges uh, offices uh, everything you can see but if you should know the all these were built, the whole country's richness is built from the money from colonial uh, countries india being the most important one india africa uh, or whichever country britain ruled they to call these monies and all those huge buildings palaces and everything you see in britain are the uh, you can call a money or a subsidy kind of thing given by india the rich india of the 19th century payments for shipping and insurance services so you see th there is not even a single thing which is not uh, which is uh, uh, being paid by british themselves everything is paid by indian money so th that was a uh, few of the points deindustrialization so we are going to see now what we saw was drain theory now we'll see each of the industry or uh, entire economic impact on british india we'll see different different sectors and different different classes of people deindustrialization one way free trade from net exporter to net importer we knew like indians were a great exporter i like the uh, whether it be uh, jewels or gems or uh, cotton whatever it was indian india was a great exporter net exporter but it was crumbled and it was changed into a net importer by very uh, harsh british policies 
cheap and machine made goods flooded indian market so the indian handicrafts or whatever was there was all totally ignored and they were not allowed to go to england markets instead raw materials from here will go to there and then they will send the machine made goods because industrial revolution was at its peak at that time in england they will send those goods to indian market so they will force indians to buy goods which they can actually produce themselves railway network was an added advantage chartered act 1813 if you know about this act it was in this act that the england government uh, told or took away the monopoly of the company earlier the company had a free uh, choice of trading all the goods and they were the only ones who could trade in the eastern part of the world that was the permission given by the uh, british uh, actually uh, british government back in england but uh, in 1813 act the monopoly was taken away and others other traders from england also could come not only the companies other english people also could come and trade they were it was only restricted to i mean the company could now only have a monopoly in tea and trade with china other than that everything was uh, given uh, given equal rights to other traders as well so obviously when they uh, uh, see these kind of restrictions put on them they will try to uh, show all that anger on to indian system or indian people by 1820 european markets almost closed for indian goods so like we already told indian goods could not enter the european markets loss of traditional livelihood loss of patronage by indian rulers and nobles we have seen this already in decline of mughals also uh, the uh, indian rulers used to uh, give uh, rewards or give recognition to uh, skillful or talented artisans and they would give some uh, Uh, reward like uh, gold coins or something they'll give. We have seen in movies and all. So these things are the patronage itself was crumbled because the British government never cared of what Indians are making or what Indians are investing in. So it was total loss for Indian artisans. Rapid deindustrialization while England was becoming more rich industry because industry. Okay, we have already discussed this point. There it was growing and here it was crumbling. Ruralization. Ruralization means artisans are now faced losses, sold off products, and they have to shift to villages. so people who were like kind of an urban class they became rural people because all their traditions and craft was not being recognized and they could not uh, make any money out of it so that is about ruralization agriculture burden was one of the primary causes of poverty in india we have already studied about the debt trap and all the um, harsh uh, Uh, settlement policies in india on the farmers peasantry again permanent settlement rate right wise system mile wise system this was what i was talking about uh, we have made a, ta- a tabular column to compare uh, do a comparative study of all these three systems we will uh, show you in the agriculture related chapter so government bothered only about revenues zamindars burdened the peasants so british was uh, uh, waiting for revenue from zamindars and zamindars uh, were very harsh on the riots to gain maximum profit money lenders involved and influence judiciary triple burden to peasants so we know like taxes are very high and it's a very simple point which you can understand stagnation of agriculture so there were no incentives like you know like in the present day uh, in the india agriculture is not taxed and also they are given subsidies and they are given a uh, lot of incentives like uh, um, or they are given lot of uh, advanced uh, seeds or advanced technology irrigation systems lot of things are provided by the government itself for the revival of agriculture but british government in turn they did not provide anything and even when the during the time of famines or during the time of drought they even expected high taxes there was no leverage or there was no um, ease easiness or uh, what to say the burden was not at all reduced for the farmers and fragmentation of land you know like indian uh, farmers Uh, what they do is when a peasant uh, uh, dies, he, uh, his land will be distributed among his son. So if there are four sons, the land will be distributed into four portions. So when generation after generation it will go, the land size will also become less and less. So when the land size becomes less, obviously the productivity also will become less. And out of that small land, they have to still pay the high taxes which British government is demanding. Famine and poverty. it was actually a forced famine now usually famine happens uh, when there is no rainfall or there is continuous drought situation or something like that and the grains food grains would be less but in the time of british india it was actually a forced famine by colonial rule 
about 2.8 crore people died in the 1850s that is during that time up to 1900s so while the forced famine the britishers used to get all these food grains in and in taxes and store in their storage for their personal use even when indian people are dying they did not care and they did not think of redistributing it to the people who are dying so the famine was actually forced one by storing the excess production commercialization of indian agriculture the way of life was transformed transformed to business enterprise so you know like agriculture was actually a way of life for indians right from the uh, age of harappan civilization or the prehistoric times indians were doing agriculture not as a business they were doing it for their own survival and the rest they may sell it or do it exchange with the other farmers or other artisans but britishers changed into a completely a business model kind of thing and they forced cash crops and plantations so instead of growing rice and wheat they were forcing the uh, indians to grow cotton indigo rubber uh, uh, jute all these things which can be a big uh, a trade product they wanted they never cared of what whether people had enough to eat or not they only thought about uh, making these kind of profit from cash crops obviously the price will shoot up and they all these price shooting up will not uh, gain anything to the poor farmers they will buy at cheap rates or as taxes from these poor farmers and then the middlemen will distribute to the uh, higher uh, higher rich classes or the britishers and other uh, others who came to trade in india so peasants obviously resisted and lot, there were a lot of peasant movements there is a chapter chapter 17 which deals about all the peasant movements in india there we will see one important name i wanted to mention is deccan riots in 1875 where Uh, large scale riots happened so just remember the name as of now details we'll see later who were the leaders and how it was suppressed or how it was uh, uh, how it proceeded we'll see that later late development of modern industry so you know like the industrial revolution was in full flow in england but in india nothing was promoted the britishers only cared of creating road and rail networks and then Uh, taking off all the materials raw materials from here and then uh, the cheap machine goods from england will come to india Uh, so just to uh, say a timeline the first cotton textile industry in bombay came in 1853 and the first jute mill came in bengal in 1855 just see the place names and times and uh, initially it was started by indians but most of the one will be owned by foreigners and obviously no profit will go to indians so again the same point raw materials were taken from india and india was considered as a market huge investments were happening in india across from across the world but everything was profit motive and uh, motive and every uh, richness or every money was going out of india indians could not grow because of credit problems poor technology etc so indians did not have the funds to start their own company they like now we have the startup india startup india everything but that time there was nothing which government will do for indians they had no money to start a new industry even if they started everything was handmade they did not have the technology or machines to Uh, become uh, or give equal competition to the uh, british companies regional disparities because you know the indians uh, sorry the british india they did not create rail networks for the good uh, good of uh, or well being of india indian people they created rail networks in such a way that the things which are being produced at one particular place can be carried on to the Uh, ports or from where they could ship it back to england so all the railway networks if you see which was created at that time was created that motive alone so obviously regional disparities will come only in those regions where suppose like uh, if you have uh, tea plantations in assam and if you want to export it from there to a particular port that is how they will set up the uh, railway network they won't care if people from rural india has to come to urban india or they have to go to a particular city or they did not think of a metro concept they on only thought of taking their goods out of uh, india to different places within india or outside india so that is how railway networks were developed rise of indian bourgeois class bourgeois it is spelled as bourgeoisie so it's a french term actually for middle class people so initially they were the people who were junior officers under these british capitalists so they tried helping distributing imports and exports meaning they were trying to help the indian people the indian goods but what happened was they could not function independently obviously the britishers would put restrictions and uh, put terms and conditions like you can do business only in this part you can do trading only in this part and so it was an entirely crumbling the indian market or indian economy this one is the last point taxes railway and free trade taxes i have already discussed multiple times railway 
I have told you now already in English were set up with Indian money but it was benefiting the Britishers and imports focused more. So imports of those cheap machine made goods were focused more. Only raw materials were exported. So there is one statement actually here. Yeah, this is one G. V. Joshi. He remarked that expenditure on railways is an Indian subsidy to British industries. So the whatever investment was made in railway, it was like the Indian people giving a subsidy to the British industries. Like uh, the government is giving subsidies to Indians now for their growth. It was like some something which Indians gave to the Britishers for the growth of their industries. So this is I think the last thing in this chapter. Taxation and one-way free trade we have already discussed. So these are the economic uh, stagnation of India. We have given enough points to you, so you will be able to form a very good answer. These are again quotes mentioned in this chapter. There are a lot of uh, important ones. I have taken only about uh, leaders or people which you will know, like uh, Curzon, Bipin Chandra, Lala Lajpat Rai, So you will just read it out. The progress, sorry, the Congress is tottering to its fall and one of my great ambitions while in India is to assist it to a peaceful demise. Lord Curzon, if you know, he was the one uh, Viceroy at the time of the Swadeshi movement and the partition of Bengal. So he's, he told like the Congress was already crumbling and what he wanted during his time of being Viceroy is he wanted to end it peacefully. So he was a very uh, imperialistic person or maybe uh, a pro-British kind of person with no uh, concession or no feelings for the Indian nationalists or Indian movements. So he, this was a very harsh statement by him. The next one, the period from 1858 to 1905 was the seed time of India, Indian nationalism and the early nationalists sowed the seeds well and deep. So this is actually Vipin Chandra who is always telling good things about Indian nationalists and Indian National Congress. We have already seen when what he told during the safety wall theory also. He is telling that Indian nationalists were doing the right thing and they sowed the seeds well and deep for proper rise of nationalism. Next one, it was best an opportunist movement. It opened opportunity for treacheries and hypocrisies. It enabled some people to trade in the name of patriotism. So again, he Lava is like somewhere in the middle path. He is telling like Indians used it as an opportunity. Many middlemen and many bourgeois class, which we saw, they used. Uh, they, it enables some people to trade in the name of patriotism. It's not only telling about the middlemen, it's also telling about the Congress leaders who were representing the INC. So, because Lala Rajpatra, you know, he will be an extremist, he is not a moderate. He felt like the people who were uh, getting representation, the early nationalists, they were getting appeased by the uh, representation they got. They are representing India, they are in the parliament or they are in the uh, INC meetings. So, in the name of patriotism, they are doing things for their own self gain. That is what Lala Lajpat Rai had to tell about the moderates. Next is taxation raised by the king is like the moisture sucked by the sun to be returned to the earth as fertilizing rain. But the moisture raised from Indian soil now descends as fertilizing rain largely on other land and not on India. So R.C. that we showed you the picture also, he is an economic critic and he is telling exactly the right thing. Usually when king will tax, like Akbar and all used to tax the Indians, they will tax it and whatever is taxed will come and return to Indian people as in, in some form, some gain, some benefits will be there. But when the Britishers came, whatever was being taxed was being coming back as rainfall, coming back as good benefits, not to Indian land but to other land, other land meaning England. So this was a very powerful statement by R.C. that which gives you the total idea of what was his mindset. Now we will see prelims questions and then end this chapter. Who among the following became the president of Indian National Congress more than once? So I have not taken the lecture for Indian National Congress. I will tell you one thing, just Google, uh, just put in Google like Indian National Congress President's Wikipedia page. They have given in detail year by year in picture with the picture and with the year. And it's very easy to understand the total when you will see like when did Mahatma Gandhi become the national president, when did Farajji Naidu become the national president. Up till the present date, all the Indian national leaders are mentioned there. So there are a lot of questions which can be found out of it. Like who was the first Indian, who was the first Muslim, who was the first woman, who was the whether any foreigners have become the president of India, sorry, president of Indian National Congress, I mean. So these things are mentioned there. Also, this question you can answer from there, whether these people have become the president more than once. Okay.
you have to tell me who in the following becomes you have to see in wikipedia and answer this question of, of, of course we will be taking a lecture later but only if you, you if you do it yourself you will have a sense of uh, uh, what to say a feeling to go and explore things so please answer this question by looking into wikipedia page next question which of the following were published by dada bhai narwaji again you have to tell the works by him i have not mentioned these names in this uh, chapter but i think in the first or second chapter we have mentioned this so try answering this out of these four uh, books which are written by dada bhai narwaji voice of india sudarak bombay herald and poverty india or uh, if everything is not written by him you have to tell me which one is written by who which is not written by dada bhai narwaji and who actually wrote it so try exploring and please try to answer because time is running out and we have to start practicing questions or it will cost you prelims 2018 very badly so please try answering the questions and if you want to purchase the entire pdf which has over 320 questions of uh, modern indian history based on spectrum and the ncrts please contact our facebook page vice ias this is the link we will come up with the chapter 8 soon till then enjoy learning thank you have a nice day